All right. So I'll start that again. Uh, welcome everyone to the September conference call. Um, we've got some exciting things tonight. I know Jim Hallbison uh, has some things he's going to cover, but before we do that, um, I think we want to introduce you to one of our newest employees, uh, James Schultz. Um, I'm just looking down the list to see if James is on. I see him there. James, if you're, uh, there you are. Um, would you mind saying a few words about yourself and introducing yourself to anyone who hasn't met you? James is, uh, started with us back in May. So I think a lot of you have met him at this point, but if you haven't, um, this will be a good introduction of James for you. Yeah. Welcome everybody. Thanks for the introduction, Russ. I come to Growers Mineral with 10 years of agronomy experience and also a background of growing up on a farm. Over the years, the family farm had hogs and dairy. Now my younger brother is a cash crop food grade operation and I farm also a little on the side myself. I hail from the thumb of Michigan, so about an hour of north side of downtown Detroit, and glad to join the team. From what I've seen so far, we have some excellent DMs and farms on the program for years. It's really exciting to be part of this team. I'm looking forward to helping everyone in the future. All right, thanks, James. Um... Yeah, and, and uh, feel free if you have any questions, you know, feel free to give him a call, shoot him an email. He's uh, he's, he's always available. Um, with that, Jim, uh, you all, all set to go? Yeah, you got me, Russ. We can hear you. Um, and I've got Daniel's pictures that he sent over. So whenever he's ready, um, right. yeah, just let me know. We'll do that. We'll do that. Thanks, all Russ. Right. Uh, my name is Jim. Jim Hallbison, and uh, I'm going to be in charge of the uh, conference call tonight. <clears throat> the origination of the conference call <laughs> goes back quite a few number of years uh, where we wanted to try to uh, open the door for our clientele, our salesmen, and a lot of our salesmen, our customers, uh, to try to make contact, you know, with our customer base. And uh, the things that we see, the, the Growers Network includes, you know, 31, 32 different states. Uh, and we're in a couple of provinces of Canada. We've done some work in Mexico. So uh, our, our whole base is very broad. And uh, we call it the Growers Network, and we're very proud of it. Uh, again, uh, it gives potential customers and customers the opportunity to talk to other farmers. Uh, we have many of our guys that uh, like to talk to us in the home office because they know we're trying to make a contact with everybody in the organization. And a lot of these guys use that information for their marketing program. Uh, again, there's always suspect as far as uh, the government reports are concerned or the advisors that uh, we get in the different networks that you can pay for. And many guys feel that getting it straight from other farmers is a little bit more reliable. And the fact that our network or our geographic network is fairly large, uh, that seems to be very advantageous to uh, our customer, customer base, and our sales network. So at the conference call, basically, we've been focusing on the grower's calendar. Uh, if you have the, the uh, 24 calendar, uh, the September uh, calendar picture this year is from the south. Uh, we discuss uh, <clears throat> Daniel uh, Weaver will uh, be chatting about what's going on. Uh, Daniel's home base is Georgia. He does work in Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, Tennessee. Uh, he gets around the horn a little bit and we're going to ask Daniel to uh, kind of talk about the different things that he's working on. And Russ alluded to the fact that Daniel has pictures of some of the things that he's doing in the South. And again, our customer base in the Carolinas, they, they will be very interested in some of the crops that Daniel's working with. But it gives everyone a very good perspective of how broad based the growers product is. And it can be used. We had a gentleman in Canada said, if it's green and growing, growers will work on it. So, again, uh, the versatility of the product. And 
you know, again, we try to talk about, yeah, that's right, Russ, thanks. That's the September picture for those of you that are, you know, on your iPad, computer, or smartphone. Um, and they, they're two different car cotton harvesters there. Uh, one is the uh, bulk one, and then the other one puts it in big round bales. And Daniel can talk more articulately, articulately about that than I can. But again, uh, we were on the farm with this gentleman and discussing, you know, his business. And uh, I think farmers will find that uh, regardless of what kind of equipment you're running, the type of equipment, uh, the dealers are still uh, sometimes not very cooperative. Because I asked this gentleman, what's the biggest problem with repairing, you know, a car cotton harvester? And he said, well, this green paint, it would be John Deere. So again, that uh, kind of gives you the idea that farmers deal with a lot of similar problems. And see, that's why the network is so important, guys, to talk about the different things that, that's going on in agriculture. So my job in this um, conference call is basically to try to let everyone know what I'm hearing, uh, you know, across the country. We travel in the summer and the winter. We do uh, winter meetings where we talk about the growers program, the philosophy, how we think it works. Uh, how you can incorporate it into your operation. And the guys that uh, we always love to have long-term customers come to these meetings because new farmers can talk with these guys and ask them, you know, what their approach is and how it's working for them. So again, that interaction between a potential customer, a brand new customer, and the old customers. And again, you know, we're working on guys that are fourth generation in our organization, we're very proud of that because we feel that the program does work. Uh, what portion of the program you want to look at, uh, we'll tell you what we know, and then uh, you try to implement that. So at these conference calls, we try to follow that calendar. So if you do get a calendar from your salesman, uh, it kind of gives you an idea of what uh, what area of the country we're going to be focused on and uh, what those guys will be talking about. So what I do at the beginning of the conference call usually is give this summary of what I'm hearing back uh, from the customers. Uh, actually, I got a brand new guy out of Indiana that's been ringing my phone off of the hook talking about how to implement the program in different methodologies and what what is good for him or what is our base philosophy, and we've been discussing that and giving him some ideas. And probably the biggest problem we deal with is all of the competition. The establishment basically is to saying that you can't grow a crop with that dinky amount of fertilizer. And the biggest problem right now is the cost of fertilizer. So that's, some, so that's something that uh, we try to talk about you know, at, at these particular meetings. So uh, the first thing right off the bat, and Russ summarized that in the invitation, is the Wozni report that came out today. That's 12 o'clock Eastern, 11 in the Central Zone. And basically the government has raised the um, yield, the corn yield to the highest level ever. Uh, they've held the acres the same. So the production is going to be up. Now they have said that the usage is going to be up also so that the carry out of the 24, 25 no, crop no. will go down a little bit. So again, that, uh, that did bring the corn price down a little bit, but I looked at the market right before we started the call and uh, corn is pop back up again. It's gaining almost everything that it lost today. Now, soybeans, they basically are holding the yield the same, keeping the uh, acres pretty much the same, uh, but their usage figures are lowering the carryout for the 24-25 crop. So soybeans have gained a little, uh, a little production or a little uh, price action that's uh, in many areas, uh, they, they've crept back up in a 10 buck range for early for early drop. Now your fall drop or harvest drop is not gonna be in that 10 buck range in most cases, other than in the East possibly. But again, this, this price action is gonna be determining 
what's going to happen in the fertilizer market. The uh, DTN uh, today had a very detailed discussion by Rabobank. Rabobank is come to the U.S. from Holland. Uh, it's a Dutch bank that has made uh, definite investments in agriculture. And their prediction on fertilizer prices is uh, that it's going to stay pretty stable, that we're not going to see a lot of deflation. And the only nutrient that they see possibly going down would be potassium uh, because of the volumes that are on the market. And the usage was down last year because of the higher prices. Now, nitrogen and phosphorus, that's basically uh, stable to up a little bit. And if you talk to our sales force, uh, we just set our price for the uh, 25 season. And our guys did a very good job, in my opinion. Uh, we've got the price just about the same, down a little bit. Uh, and most phosphorus fertilizers right now, if you look at a year ago price, they're up uh, between 5 and 10%. So usually... This is about the low point in that process, and that's basically what Rabo Bank is saying, that if we don't get any perk in uh, cash prices later this fall, uh, that uh, fertilizer usage is going to, they're going to start whittling because it's just not going to pencil out as far as guys' uh, bottom line is or what they're going to do about their operating loans. And see, a lot of people are still looking at that interest rate. The U.S. interest rate, they're discussing a drop in that next week because the consumer price index numbers supposedly are stabilizing a little bit. The only problem is the, the normal stables are not stabilizing enough. Uh, fuel is backed off a little bit. Well, gasoline, per se, but not diesel fuel. And see, that's really uh, went into this inflation problem. And, and farmers are seeing it quite directly. Uh, what we try to tell guys, it's it's delivery, man. It's it's trucking. That's the problem. And fuel is a big part of that problem. And so, again, uh, this is uh, something we've tried to get more efficient at uh, to try to uh, keep that trucking cost a little under control. But there's only so much you can do with the kind of inflation that we've got now. So uh, basically, the whole industry is saying at this point, uh, it looks like uh, we're, we're going to have uh, some reduction in uh, fertility usage. Nitrogen, I talked with uh, Gerald Hurst today. Gerald handles a lot of 28, 32 percent off of the docks in Baltimore. And uh, he's saying right now the prices that's quoted to him are very similar to where he finished last spring. Um, down a little bit, but again, the trucking issue is putting them very close together. So he's thinking at this point that uh, uh, he doesn't see any relenting as far as the nitrogen market is concerned. DTN's price schedule is saying that urea has come down, but there was a perk in urea in June uh, because Egypt basically stopped the manufacture of urea at that point. And the biggest input in nitrogen is natural gas. And so uh, Europe, natural gas prices have gone up significantly. Uh, the shipping of natural gas out of the U.S. Uh, into Europe has been slowed down significantly. So again, with their high demand for natural gas, and it's been uh, the summer, basically, with the high heat numbers, uh, the usage of natural gas for air conditioning has been very extreme. So that's kept the price high. Uh, and so, again, that, that affects the nitrogen market directly. The interesting thing about nitrogen, uh, guys, is this uh, uh, green ammonia that they're talking about now. The whole industry is in a uh, definite race to try to produce anhydrous, which is a source of all nitrogen, uh, without any emission of CO2 into the atmosphere. And there's a lot of different um, usages or ways of doing that. Uh, we as a company are looking at uh, one particular way that guys are doing that. Uh, we just don't know where it fits yet. You know, we're not talking a lot about it. Uh, the company has made a decision to 
examine this or to research this because we feel that this is uh, where the industry's heading. And uh, actually, there was a big article on the um, Google website uh, today about green ammonia out of Manitoba, Canada. And the, the big issue with that is you're collecting hydrogen from natural gas and shoving it into the nitrogen that's in the atmosphere that we've got. And the problem is where, where does that hydrogen come from? If it comes from natural gas, your emission into the atmosphere is carbon dioxide. And they're trying to lower that as much as they can. So there's two ways of doing it. Either make it without using uh, methane or natural gas or to basically cut the rate. And see, at growers, we've been talking about this rate cut on nitrogen basically for 70 years. You know, in the beginning, everybody was using livestock manure for their nitrogen source. And then as we got deeper into the 60s and the 70s, you know, everybody went to uh, artificial nitrogen. And see, that uh, is all predicated on what's in the atmosphere, but it's made into anhydrous, and then all other forms are made from that. But the manufacture of anhydrous is very CO2 intensive. And so these different academics are trying to come up with ways to make it uh, without emitting CO2 into the atmosphere. Uh, the problem with that is, is uh, if you're going to use electricity for the process, where is the electricity coming from? And see, that uh, pretty well begs the question of how green is the actual ammonia. And the article that was uh, on the internet today from Canada is basically saying that many of the, uh, the world's politicians are very reluctant. Uh, they, they talk a great game about climate change and going green and that type of thing uh, with other industries. And we're seeing that in the states. You know, a lot of municipalities are trying to lower their CO2 emissions. Uh, and a lot of countries are in that vein. But the problem is if it's going to affect food production, the politicians are very reluctant to go after that. And that's where they're saying there will be a definite slowdown possibly in this looking at uh, the green ammonia. But uh, we're viewing it from a different perspective. We think it's an energy level thing and uh, making it uh, in a particular way without bringing the salts and the brine with the nitrogen in a cleaner form, maybe we possibly could even cut the rate more. Basically, we're saying that when you apply calcium to the soil, you're basically invigorating the biological life in the soil. <clears throat> and the nitrogen fixers, which with legumes are, you know, uh, in the... Uh, legume nodules, basically, uh, that those are very high consumers of calcium. They're aerobic in nature, so you got to get the soil opened up, get it breathing, and then you got to feed it the calcium. And see, we're saying the use of a clean fertility product doesn't imbalance that, that usage. And see, <clears throat> you start talking uh, potash and 0060, you throw that KCL out there, we're saying that that chlorine has a very negative effect on the microbes that can fix atmospheric nitrogen. So again, that's where we say using a uh, lower uh, uh, metal content, uh, using something that has no chlorine or very little chlorine can be very advantageous to the soil biology and you can utilize what's in the atmosphere or in the soil itself. And see the heavy metal content in fertility products uh, is really gaining a lot of attention. There's been several articles about the relationship between the heavy metal cadmium and dementia uh, and Alzheimer's. And basically phosphate fertilizer is really the biggest source of cadmium in the environment. Uh, there's always been discussion about smoking, but where did the tobacco get the cadmium? It was from high phosphate fertilization, basically. So again, uh, this is something that uh, we feel is going to have to be addressed. Uh, actually, Michigan State University has a trial going on up there right now where they're examining how cadmium is getting into the food chain 
when they test the soil, the levels haven't increased that much. So how, why is it all of a sudden becoming a problem? Well, <clears throat> if they look at the correct research, it's very well known that cadmium and calcium are almost uh, twin sisters. Uh, they have the same atomic radius. Uh, they have the same electronic structure. Uh, they're very similar in size. And uh, there's research that dates back to the late 1800s that said that when animals were consuming products that were higher in cadmium, if they had a high calcium diet, no problem. Uh, as soon as you restrict the calcium in the diet, uh, the animal would seek the cadmium to replace the calcium. So again, we think the growers program basically uh, takes care of that. Tom Swearzak, who we worked with from the University of Kentucky, pretty well substantiated that for us. So uh, we think the program and this idea of talking about quality of crops uh, is very, very, very uh, important. And, uh, you know, we're working with some hemp producers. Uh, that market has kind of cooled off a little bit. Uh, uh, but uh, they were very strategic in analyzing their products, looking for these metals. And uh, another one <laughs> just recently has uh, gained notoriety in the, the public domain is um, lead uh, that's in uh, cinnamon, for example. And again, they're saying that this is coming out of the soil. Well, again, that is a, that's a calcium factor right there. Uh, they're looking at pH, trying to figure out, you know, where the calcium level is at. And that's not the way you got to do it. You got to look at cation exchange capacity and look at ratios between the calcium and the magnesium to see how effective the calcium is and see this has been the basis of the growers program from day one. And so, again, those are a couple things that uh, are occurring right now that uh, we think uh, we've got the answer for. And uh, again, that uh, that'll eventually come to revelation. I believe we'll see that uh, this quality of crop is related to the type of fertility projects the guys are using and how it affects the microbiological life. Uh, the, the other thing, since we talked last April, uh, that is uh, really uh, stuck out. Uh, and I think it was probably going on at that point, we talked a little bit about it, is this beef on dairy thing. Uh, the U.S. government uh, came out and had a discussion about, you know, where net farm income was going. And the one that they released in the spring, which is late February, early March, was very, very uh, negative about profits in agriculture, uh, basically tied to um, commodity prices. Now, the one they just released here in early September, they tampered that down a little bit uh, because, again, uh, the livestock market, particularly the uh, beef market, has uh, demonstrated that uh, it's brought in some fairly significant profits for guys. And see, the dairymen are capitalizing on that, uh, basically breeding their cows, uh, the beef animals. <clears throat> when we were touring out in the field, Several of our very good clients said that uh, they've been doing this now for for a certain period of time, and it's been a very, very good uh, uh, cash flow for them. Actually, one of our very good customers, he said he's breeding everything beef and then buying his replacements from uh, guys that have, uh, you know, genetic ideas that he's got, and they're able to – and. Some guys are saying that they are taking their best cows and breeding them. Uh, sex semen has really changed this a lot, guys. You know, they can go after those high producers, you know, and, and get that heifer uh, through the sexing of the semen. So they're, they're lower quality animals, I guess I'll say. They're breeding them to beef. And uh, this is uh, those animals. I talked to several dairy guys this summer saying that, you know, these three, four, five day old calves are bringing a thousand bucks. And they said they just can't walk away from that. And actually, we've got several customers uh, that uh, are feeding these, you know, young calves and getting them up to three, 350. And then they're going to the feedlot. Uh, some of these are uh, done on a consignment basis where the, uh, the organization is basically 
effectively bringing their veterinarians in, telling the guys how to feed them. Uh, and then you're basically kind of like the chicken business. You're just the caretaker there. Uh, although we have some guys that are accumulating these animals themselves. Uh, they're feeding them the way they think they know how to feed young animals like that. And uh, several of them, our, our district manager is saying, doing very well with it. Uh, the problem is keeping them alive. And again, uh, the experience and the quality of crops that you're using and the way you feed them is a big deal. Uh, I don't have any experience with that. You've got to talk to our dairy boys about that. Uh, but there's a significant amount of interest in it. And it appears that that side of agriculture, the livestock side, and there's actually discussion about the hog market coming back uh, significantly. We have a very large hog producer in Worthington, Minnesota, and he's been talking about, you know, the demand for hogs in Mexico and how he said, without Mexico, we're in deep, we're in deep doo-doo. Uh, but he said, uh, they've best been buying like crazy. And the Rainbow Bank discussion was saying that's one of the things that is uh, tempering down that this this profitability in agriculture because they expect the hog market to come back and and be very competitive because beef just can't keep going to the moon and uh, the the consumer is eventually going to make a decision here and and go with something you know a little cheaper. They claim that the <laughs> the volume of sausage in the grocery store is really going to be the determining factor. As we see that increase, uh, the consumer is finally saying they just can't afford hamburger anymore. So again, that's, uh, that's going to be a discussion point uh, that uh, is going to come to the forefront. So um, I think as far as current events, the only other thing I would like to point out to you guys is um you know, the organic industry is is uh, struggling a little bit. Again, I don't, James can talk more articulately about that than I can. Uh, the only thing I know is there's been uh, several articles um, and not necessarily agricultural, although there was one from uh, AgWeb this week where they basically went after the organic industry and the cheating that goes on in the organic industry. But uh, the situation there is um, how, how will this thing uh, continue this way without um, any kind of artificial nitrogen? And see, this is uh, some of the uh, green ammonia that they're talking about or green nitrogen is basically going to be coming from electricity, which is basically like a thunderstorm. So if these things are going to be accepted uh, by the organic industry, this thing will get more legs under it. Uh, our research basically right now shows that uh, when you're talking about uh, making uh, nitrogen from electricity, there's a lot, a lot of issues that have to be addressed. And so um, we're kind of involved with that, uh, and it's, it's a water issue, um, and nobody knows more about water than the growers network. I can tell you that for a fact. And so those of you that are new listening tonight, and this water situation is, um, it's very significant, very significant. And so our guys can help you with that. It just doesn't affect us, although that's a direct effect on uh, using growers uh, as a spray material, but it's affecting all your other compounds too. So again, uh, those are things that we can talk about. We can help you learn how to deal with that issue. But to get back to this acceptance of nitrogen in the organic world, <clears throat> manure has become a big issue there. Um, chicken waste, uh, dairy waste, and another big waste is human waste. And what we're seeing is a thing called PFAS. Uh, this is an organic compound that is ending up in human waste uh, that it, when it's being applied to soil is bringing compounds in there that just uh, they're calling them forever chemicals. And they've been tied to different maladies health-wise in the human chain. And there's been some areas where 
farmers had basically been shut down. They found PFAS in their animals, uh, found PFAS in their soil. <clears throat> this has uh, turned out to be a fairly large problem, and the politicians are very reluctant uh, to talk about this or expose it directly because uh, there could be mountains of human waste that they don't know what to do with. So what we're saying to our clientele and, and potential clientele is if you're looking at um, biosolids per se or human waste, this is something you have to take into consideration. Um, we have a district manager in New York that uh, worked with a liming product that had biosolids in it. And uh, the numbers of <clears throat> the calcium in the biosolid material was very good and had an effect uh, on loosening the soil when we applied it. But <clears throat> when it was put on forages, he was starting to get fungal infections, uh, vomicillins that he hadn't seen before with regular calcium products. And see, at that point, we just really didn't know what was going on. So he told guys to quit using it. And today it appears that he was well ahead of his time. That goes back maybe 15, 20 years. Uh, he recognized that there was something going on in the soil uh, with that human excrement. And today the you know, the, the analysis for PFAS, again, is much better because technology has come a long ways. But um, no. you have to be yeah. very careful it's with it. Fine. We've got guys that uh, basically are out of business no, no, uh, no, from no. using the human waste. So if you're looking at that as a way to supplement your nitrogen, uh, whether it's organic or not, uh, this is something you got to look at very closely, in my opinion. So, well, at that point, Daniel... I don't want to take away any of your thunder. So uh, if you're out there and you want to start chatting a little bit, um, and then when you are interested in uh, bringing up the pictures, Russ can throw them right up there like he did the uh, September calendar picture. And uh, once you see the picture, then you can kind of run with it, per se, and uh, head in any direction that you want. Okay, can you hear me? Yep, I got you loud and clear, partner. All right, well, good evening, everyone. It's good to have an opportunity to get on here and share a little bit of our success down here and, and also some of our failures, maybe. Uh, <laughs> but it, it's, it's really a... Uh, uh, challenge and it's been a very good year for me down here. Probably my sales for the year will be down a little bit, but it, I am amazed that I came right on through the summer and I haven't tallied it all up, but I'm not going to be off as much as I thought I was at start. But now, uh, Russ, go back to the beginning picture, a uh, calendar picture. Still Give me one moment, Daniel. I'll bring it up, all right? Do I? Give me one second again. I'll, I'll pull that up, all right? Yeah. <laughs> this is really a challenge for us working with these old guys. So <laughs> He's supposed to be able to do it magically. <laughs> uh, for some reason, Zoom changed their... Uh your settings so you can only share one thing at a time so there we go okay uh, now just a few things here uh, jim already talked some about it but this uh the the thing on this calendar picture it said uh, cotton in the southeast well this picture is more has been cotton because it's all picked here already uh but just a little bit, <laughs> that machine that you see right there in front of you, that has a, that rolls the cotton like a, a round hay baler. You can see it on the back of that thing. It sits up there and right behind that thing, then it drops down. They can keep right on going through the field. It, it opens up and kicks that bale out and starts another new bale without even stopping. Uh but that machine is probably over a million dollars brand new from the factory. So you got to pay for it. The machine on the left, you can't really see it, but it has a basket and then it fills that basket. And then you dump it in that wagon back behind it. 
And then that wagon goes over into a bale uh, module maker uh, and they dump it in there and they have a, a cylinder packer that goes all along that thing and packs that stuff real hard. And then when they, get, when they get it full, they just lift the thing up and it leaves the module there and they put a tarp over top of it and it sits in the field. I know for all you people from the South, the East, South, or wherever we have cotton, this is all old news to you and you could probably give a better description than I can. So now I would like to have one of the cotton, the, the, I'd like to have the other cotton pictures next if I can, Russ. While he's getting that, I'll keep talking. Uh, we're just getting into cotton a little bit more and doing some tests and cotton and peanuts both. Uh, we're having a lot of good luck, but it's like, uh, uh, it's, it, it, it's like, uh, I don't know what, what you call it, but it's a lot of work to get it done. It's commit, these people have done this for years and years and years, and they, they are convinced, they, and they are, they do know how to grow cotton. I'm not going to uh, say they don't know how to grow cotton, but we can help them with our program. This is a field of cotton. Uh, this did not have, it was a 100-acre field. We split it in half. We done 50 acres on his regular commercial program. And uh, and you can see where it was already picked on the right of this picture. That was our 50 acres. But if you look at this picture close, look at between the rows and look how how much space you have between the rows, how, how uh, it, it's just not as white. All right, and I want the next cotton picture if you can. All right, the, the next picture is with our program on it. Really on this, and you probably can't hardly see it, if I, you could expand this a lot. It, right on the right side of this picture, you can see it gets, gets thicker and whiter just for about a two or three rows there. And that goes over mm -hmm. into where it actually a little bit of our, our plot starts in there. But uh, you got the other picture, Russ, there. Now look at the difference. Now they were planted the same day. That other was done 100% like he usually does his cotton and this was 100% our program. The sad thing about this whole thing is I could never get the farmer. I talked to him tonight. I was wanting him to come on and talk, but he didn't want to. Uh, but he'll tell you that there's no question the cotton was a lot better here. Well, you can see it here on the picture. It's just tremendous more cotton where we've done our program. Uh, and, and the thing is, when you got through picking, ours picked cleaner than theirs did. Uh, it, uh, it, it just opened up better. It was, it was just a beautiful field of cotton. You know, but we did not get the yields, and that's one thing I needed really bad. I thought Mr. David was going to get the yields, uh, and we got the weights of the cotton, but we just... We we got to go out there and measure the exact acres to get the exact yields, and I don't know if we'll ever get that or not. So that that's hey, on, on hey, them cotton pictures. Go to the next picture now. Hey hey Daniel, before we leave yeah. cotton, will you talk about our our program, what you did versus what what he did with his conventional program, fertilizer. Okay, ba basically what they do on the conventional program they. They go out and and they broadcast dry fertilizer just just like most farmers do, and the amounts vary by farmer. Uh, they they'll they'll put just I don't know what they put out there. Probably three to five hundred pounds to the acre of of uh, commercial fertilizer, and then they'll use nitrogen uh, on their cotton. Uh, which we do too. We, you, I told them on this test, I want the same amount of nitrogen as they put on their side. But then we didn't put any, any broadcast fertilizer on our side, none. Uh, we, uh, we put a three quarter gallon of growers right in the row on cotton. Now you can't put much in the row on cotton and it'll burn the seed. But a three quarter gallon per acre in the row is what we've done. 
And, and then we never put a big amount of, uh, we, we foliar fed it three times. Uh, we done it with uh, a gallon and a half of growers. And then we uh, would put in, uh, uh, a, well, it's not really a fungicide, but it's a product, all 15 that we use with, with the uh, four fungicide. We mix them two together and a quart per acre of that. And we done that uh, two times. And then the third time we only put one gallon on there. So it had four gallons and four and three quarter gallons per acre of our fertilizer. The same amount of nitrogen that they had, but we never put any other fertilizer. That's the only fertilizer they had. So that's kind of. So Daniel, the question I've got on that three quarters of a gallon uh, you do that with water on the seed? Oh, yes. Oh, yes, definitely. And I think he put about five or six gallons of water plus the three-quarter gallon of, of uh, growth. Yeah. What about, it, what about his calcium in the soil? Is that good or mediocre or non-existent? Oh, okay, that's one thing I forgot to say. We put three gallons of liquid calcium on this field before we planted because he hadn't had the other calcium on there. Uh, mm -hmm. So I would rather had lime, calcitic lime, but we did, you know, I'm not going to say for sure. He may have put a ton on the whole field, 100 acres. If he did, he put the same on everything of the lime. Sure. Uh, but I, I'm not. He does use some lime, but I'm not sure if he did last year or not. I should have checked on that. Yeah, no, that's fine. So the liquid calcium, are you putting that on with the planter or do you spray that on the soil and work it in? We spray that on the soil just before they worked it up the last time before they planted it. I got you. I got uh, you. Three okay. gallons to the acre. Yeah, no, no he, didn't, he didn't deep work it. Uh, it was just with a hair on top of the on top of the uh, ground before the, the then they aired it in and then planted it. So, okay. uh, and I was going to get a. We got two fields of cotton this year that got were done with growers. Uh, we're just going to wait and see, but I I think we're going to see some way to the top of the. The cotton looks extremely, extremely good. I wanted to get some pictures of that, and I called the, the one guy today to uh, see if he could even get some now yet, but I never got one. Uh, but th those were, we're really looking forward to those two fields of cotton to see what they end up yielding because if the weather works right, it's going to be right up there to the highest yields of anybody ever made. So it really looks good. So... Okay, and is that all on the cotton, Jim? Yeah, it looks good. Okay, now this uh, is a field of sod, and this just happened in the last, I took this picture around two weeks ago, and what this was is a guy bought 200 acres of sod, or it's 240, I think, all told, from another guy, and they said the sod just was not doing good. Uh, and so he wanted, uh, it's another sod farmer that uses my stuff that told him about my stuff. So he called me up and he said he wants to know if we can do something to help uh, make those roots mats. If for sod, you got to have the roots have to tie together to where that thing will hold when they when they cut it out and put it in in uh well they usually put it in layers or put it put it in a roll mostly in layers uh on pallets to take it out and sell it if the roots are not matted good why well, it just won't hold together and uh he said this field does not does not mat good and he wondered if we can do something for it uh, I never expected to see the difference that we've seen when I've done this as quick as we did. Uh, uh, but it, it, you have to see all, all the pictures. Uh, keep the pictures going, Russ, on this sod stuff. It's three pictures of that. 
Okay, there. The first one was where we it was the part of the field where we didn't put the stuff on. This is the part of the field where we did. Uh, and it took, a, I took this picture probably a week to 10 days. I don't know exactly. After we applied two gallons of growers and three gallons of, of liquid calcium on this soil. Uh, now he did put some, uh, I had told him they need to put uh, calcitic lime, and he did put some calcitic lime over everything. I'm still just as big a believer in calcitic lime as I ever was, but if you can't get your calcium through your calcitic lime quick enough, I, I have had good success with my liquid calcium at this time point. Uh, if you'll see the other picture now, we'll see the lime uh, whenever it comes up. Daniel, I, I only ended up getting two uh, pictures of the, the grass from you. Uh, uh, it, maybe it just didn't send because of the file size. I'm not sure. Um, oh, oh, but man, uh, we can make sure we can make sure to include that when we send the email out uh, with the uh, recording. So, Well, you can look on this picture. Look way in the back. You can see the line there. I took a picture of the, of, of the line where it was applied. And it was nice. It was very easy to see uh, a real good. Yeah, right there. Easy to see the line yep. of where where you put that, where they put that stuff, and where they didn't. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it just showed up very clear. So within ten days, we made a big difference. Now the 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 answer is going to be, and what do them roots look like in sixty days from now when they cut this stuff? Uh, that, that's what we're trying to get, but it looks like a green, healthy plant is going to make roots. And that's what our program is known for is to make good roots in a crop. And so I'm expecting to see this really change this man's field. He only done a hundred out of the 240 is all he done. Mm -hmm. Uh, and we're going to, I, I'm going to do one more, uh, uh application of two, Two gallons here, just real soon now, and that'll be that'll be all that we'll put on that then until they uh, harvest that sod. So, hey Daniel, I'd like you to yeah. comment on a couple different things. Um, <clears throat> we tell farmers that you know the best way to put calcium on dry calcium or calcitic lime, as you talked about, is to work it in. Now, obviously, this guy did not work it in. Uh, and see, I can see where a liquid calcium might get down in the soil better. But do you, what do you think the um, the, uh, the soil is like? Is it very calcium poor? And just getting something on is so much better than what they've got now that that's why they're seeing a nice response. It, it is very low in calcium. Uh, his... Uh, Base saturation on calcium was down around 50 or 55, <laughs> something like that. Okay. And so it definitely is low in calcium. So any calcium should have helped that very well. Uh, what kind of soil is it, Daniel? I mean, sandy loam, clay loam, clay? It's, uh, it's, it's kind of sandy loamish, a little towards, it's not heavy clay, but it's got some clay in it. I got uh, you. So uh, it, it's not bad soil if it would just be, if we can just get the right fertility on it, it, sure. it, it should, should really produce. Uh, but we're just going to, that's still a, uh, a job in progress, I guess. It's, so uh, sure. what's your opinion, Daniel, as far as nitrogen is concerned? You know, you're seeing this greening, you know, with just the growers you know, and the calcium, um, you, do you feel a little, little bit of nitrogen would have been helpful or is it just so low in calcium that getting the program on is really making a big difference? Well, now they did put nitrogen on like three weeks before we done this on, but I done that on everything, the whole field. Sure, sure. So, so, it so we're seeing some... a response. Yeah, you're getting some response to that nitrogen with the calcium and the growers, correct? That's right. And now you were talking about working it in. I told him as soon as he sprays this, they got pivots. 
I said, run that pivot just as soon as you're finished spraying and work, uh, water that night, uh, calcium into the ground. So he did sure. that. Yeah, sure. and, uh, that should, should have helped get, uh, cause that calcium got to go into the ground to come through the plants. Yep. Uh, exactly. just, so that's, so, so that's what he did to try to get that done. Mm -hmm. And that's about all I have on, on that. I wanted to just say a few words about peanuts, but you got any more questions about the sod? What, um, what, what are you going to, uh, when this guy, you know, cuts his side, um, you're just going to basically let him tell you what he sees as far as root mass is concerned? I'm going to go look at it, but I don't know how, I can't compare it to what was before because I didn't see the other, right. uh, but I can tell if it's good or not. <laughs> right. So, right. So I, I will go look at it when he starts harvesting it. So when, when will a, that be, Daniel? It'll be another 60 days. Okay. A lot of times they won't even harvest this until they get a frost. Really? Uh, yeah. But, and they do when it's green too, but this late stuff that's kind of behind like this, they'll let it get a frost a lot of times before they harvest it. So now do you do you know where this guy's sod is going? You know, we've worked with guys that are going to golf courses and then there's some guys that are just selling it to new developments or old developments that got bad sod to begin with. Right, yeah. Well, I don't know because see, he just bought the farm and he's probably going to have to uh find his own market, I expect. I got uh, you. And I don't know for sure what his what his plans are on that. I think he does have a broker that brokers it for him. I see. So, okay. But I don't really know where it goes. I know it goes to residential, like in Atlanta. Some of it does, but it probably don't all go to the same place. Sure, so. sure. Okay, and then on peanuts, we've been just getting into peanuts. Peanuts don't take much fertilizer, uh, but I, I'm i really seeing, I just dug up some peanuts where we've done a plot. I just done it last week, uh, and we can tell a difference where we had the growers, and uh, he he done a good, good job with his uh, uh Putting, putting his growers and he done everything just how I said. Uh, and of course, grow, uh, peanuts, especially like a lot of calcium. Uh, we, we put a lot, of, they even, you know, what we call putting land plaster or which is gypsum. We put it over the top about the time peanuts start pegging. Uh, but where we're adding some growers to it and you dig it up, you can tell a difference just by looking at it. Now, when you actually harvest it, and I've done that in the past, we can we can basically improve the yields if we use a little bit of fertilizer. A lot of people don't put fertilizer on peanuts, but if you just use like a total of two gallons or two and a half gallons in a season, it makes a good bit of difference in them peanuts. Uh, if you do it for your feed, you got to do it a couple times. And uh, so that's kind of, we're just working on that for peanuts. And it's been a good year. I mean, it's people are calling me that I, I talked to over the years, three, four, five, six years ago, and I never heard of them again. They're calling up and say, hey, I want you to come by. I, I need 500 gallons of your fertilizer. <laughs> and so that it's just been kind of fun here the last couple months. Uh, so on I, peanuts, I, I talked pe probably long enough now where I didn't talk about it as long as you did, Jim. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I know you did fine. So um, on peanuts, you don't do anything at planting time. It's all foliar work, Daniel. That's right. That's right. Now I am going to try some later on uh but i had to get get my uh, had to work into into the uh, guys program a, a little bit and it's easier to just we can mix growers right with his fungicide program and that really that just don't take no extra trip it's just hell uh, it's just real easy to do it 
so you know with with you know the fungicide on either cotton or peanuts uh how do you handle the water quality there do you just get guys to do jar tests to make sure that they mix okay how do you handle that well generally i'll i'll take your grower's kit and go out and test their water uh and then if it's any question then we jar test i got you have you found any any compound uh what be it insecticide or fungicide that gives you any special problems with the growers or most of them seem to mix okay in the southeast i have not found any that just did not that that would uh uh no, i can't think that would cloud up i haven't found any precipitate yet. precipitate yeah. yeah that's what i was trying to think about uh I, we have very good ph water uh in our area right right at home but then it gets a little higher but it's still not i don't know of any eight ph water that i have tested anywhere down in georgia mm -hmm. i'm sure yeah, it might no, that, be that, that, yeah that makes sense see usually your harder waters have calcium rock and i i just think the amount of calcium rock and in, in the southeast is very minimal yeah right so the only other thing I'd like you to discuss, Daniel, is what the season has been like. Um, you know, uh, what what's their discussion now with the hurricane? Do you expect to get a, a big deluge? And, you know, you told me at one point you were so doggone dry, you were a little concerned, but then you did get the water and things seemed to come around very nicely for you. They did. They, and we had about 10 days of rain, but then it got dry again. And But we had enough rain to do the cotton. Now, dry land corn this year didn't make anything. I mean, it was uh, 50 bushels if you're lucky. Uh, irrigated corn done very well uh, because we hit that dry spell right when corn was making it. But then beans are dry land beans are not going to do anything hardly either uh right now we might get 25 30 bushels because of this we had a rain about a, uh, a week ago eight tenths and now we got this hurricane and it's soaking it up good now again so mm -hmm. you know i think it's going to fill out the pods but we don't have don't have a lot of uh plant in the late beans at least Early beans, I'm going to make a little bit more. I had one guy told me he's picking 70 bushel beans, uh, mm -hmm. and that had growers on it, so that was a plus. <laughs> so, so one thing I would like you to discuss a little bit, Daniel, is, uh, you know, all of us here in the Midwest, re re you know, read about the guy producing 200 bushel beans, and uh, you tell me he's in your neighborhood, so... Uh, just chat a little bit about that and what you, what you think uh, is going on. Okay, well, he he made actually 216 bushels on his plot this year again. Uh, I was down there and looked at that field of beans. Uh, but he babies that plot. He has drones, he sells drones, and he uses drones. Every Monday morning, he'll take a leaf analysis and then on Wednesday, he gets the results and he goes out and sprays any any nutrient that is short. He'll spray it on Wednesday. Now he did he did uh, agree to sit down with me this winter. He has not used growers, but he agreed to to spend some time this winter looking at growers because we're all thinking that we can use growers and get his trace minerals in there without doing so many sprays. Mm -hmm. and, so that's what we're pushing on. I don't know will I sell him any or not, but I know I probably won't the first year or two on his plot, but I'm hoping I can get some test plots to where he'll try that stuff and get to where he'll use it. Uh, but generally, you know, he fertilizes pretty heavy for, for beans. Uh, but the biggest thing is, is he said – he told me that if you have any yellow leaves when the uh, when the pods are getting mature, well, you don't have enough fertilizer on it. So he puts a lot of fertilizer on. 
Mm-hmm. So you told me you thought uh, his calcium numbers weren't bad, you know, no, for, it, for it, southeast soil. No, you comment on that? He's a believer on using calcitic lime. He sure is. He, he has for years already, and I think that's why he's able to make the yields he is. Mm-hmm. Yeah, very interesting. Very interesting. So anybody, if you've got a question, you know, if you're on a regular phone, you got a star six, unmute yourself or just uh, unmute yourself on your iPhone or iPad or computer. You got anything you want to ask Daniel, because uh, we're getting about to the end of the call. So this is your opportunity to work Daniel over a little bit. You can even tell me how foolish I am if you want to. <laughs> <laughs> understand, understand. <laughs> well, if there's nobody that wants to harass Daniel, we're uh, we're up to the ten o'clock hour, so uh, we're basically going to shut it down. If uh, Chris Coles, if you've got anything you want to chat about uh, before we shut this thing down, I'll open the floor for that. Uh, uh, but again, uh, we appreciate Daniel. Uh, he's doing a great job for us down there. And, uh, uh we appreciate uh, the presentation tonight, Daniel. He did a great job. Yeah. I just want to thank Daniel as well. You know, that was an excellent presentation and you really explained, you know, a lot of guys don't know a lot about cotton or beans, uh, or I'm sorry, but peanuts. Um, so that really helps. I think some of the other guys to know that, you know, that's part of the network that we have. So how important that is. So appreciate it, Daniel. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay, that's uh, pretty well the call for tonight. And uh, we'll be back again in October. Geez, I don't have a calendar, Russ. Can you discuss what that date will be? We do the um, second Thursday of the month, and it's always 9 Eastern. Uh, so that that gives the guys in the Midwest uh, a chance to get at us. Yep. So that that day will be October tenth at nine p.m. Um, same way to call in. We'll send out the uh, email and the text uh, for links and phone numbers. And uh, with that, we'll talk to you guys all then. And uh, hope everyone has a good month. See you then. Bye.